So, Paul, you remember last week I told you it's going to be forever. It's going to take forever before I can play any VR games. Yeah, you had other expenses and life things and so many video games to play and programming programs to program and probably there's going to be health problems. Who knows? VR is in the distant future. Right. So this week, my son got a headset. Oh. Uh, Isaac, who edits the show and also the videos when I can be bothered to put those out. Um, the money he's made editing these things, he spent on an Oculus Quest. Oh, nice. Now, is it the Quest or the Quest 2? Because I think the Quest 2 is out now, right? Um, I think it's just an Oculus Quest. Better than a kick in the butt. Yeah, and uh, so I got to try the VR for the first time since, I think, 2014. So it's been six years. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the odd thing is, I think the Oculus Quest is kind of your entry tier. So it's not that much different from the dev kit 2 I was using six years ago. Like, feels like a <laughs> wow, feels like about the same field of view. Well, except that it's wire free, right? It, it here's the thing with Quest Oculus Quest. Oculus Quest is, I, I mean, I'm sure you know this, Paul. It is the standalone unit. It you just take the headset and the controllers with you anywhere, and you can play VR wherever you want. So, like, if you're in the middle of Grandma's funeral and feeling a little bored and restless, you just stick that sucker on and get in the middle of the aisle and go to town. Right, right. Or, no one will or, mind. You, no one can see what's on like, the screen. Right, nobody can see, so they don't know. Or if you're, like, on a date and the other person's really boring, you, the Oculus Quest has you covered. I'm sure there are like AR things you can do, right? Because it's got a camera on it, so you can just like replace your date with, you know, a dragon or something. Oh man, uh, what, that is a really neat feature. I'll talk about that in a second. So Oculus Quest stands alone, and all the other headsets, you know, plug into your most of the other headsets out there plug into your computer or your console, and that's that's where they get their rendering power from. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't reasonably fit a whole, wait a minute, where does the Oculus Quest get its rendering power from? Right, it must have a really good, like, um, mobile level rendering hardware, like a really good phone. Or maybe it's like all integrated, they've got it all like custom processing or something. Right, right. Um, I'm. Uh Yes, it's definitely, it's not an actual phone in there. What I'm saying is, whatever the rendering hardware they use on good phones, that's probably what it's using. Because it's only 300 bucks. Yeah, it's mean, crazy. <laughs> right? And this is what frustrates me about it. After using it for yesterday and today, I was really having a blast. I was, like... Isaac got his fill of it, and then he'd want to take a break, and then I got to play with it. And I was having so much fun. I never wanted to quit. Also, I've gotten way less... Back with the dev kit, too, I had problems with, with VR sickness, and I am not having that now. I even did something really stupid, and I did some downhill skiing. And... <laughs> and this is... You know, in the old days, I was sitting. It, with the dev kit, too, I was sitting. This time, I was standing in the middle of a room, skiing down a really steep hill. And I did feel my inner ear um, complaining really loudly to the manager that something was wrong. Like, I felt myself tipping forward at one point. You know, you're trying to lead into your skis. <laughs> Don't do that. You'll fall on your face. Um, right. So I felt myself, but you know, I, I kept it up for a few minutes before I was like, oh, that, this doesn't feel good. Where on the dev kit too, that would have been extremely uncomfortable. Like rip the headset off your head right away, kind of uncomfortable. So either the improved frame rates of modern headsets are so much better, or 
you know, I'm over some sort of hump that, you know, I've, I've pushed past that, that initial wall. Yeah, I would imagine with all the hardware custom built for the device and all the hardware in the headset, the latency's got to be really, really fine-tuned. It is super silky smooth. Oh, Just wow. Right, I wave the controllers and okay. It even has hand tracking, full hand tracking. Like it can it can if you just take the controllers off and hold up your hands in front of your face, it feels like your hands. Okay, they're conspicuously missing a lot of wrinkles, but you know they're in the right size and shape and depth. It just feels like it's mirroring my physical hands. Wow. And that's really good. <laughs> we did some experiments where, just to see what it would do, Isaac put on the headset and held up his right hand, and then I pulled up my right hand in that space where his left hand would be. And just to see what the hardware would do. And... It flipped the hand over. It assumed my palm was the back of my hand. You know, it didn't oh, think... Oh, right, because oh, obviously you don't have two right hands. <laughs> right, right. And it was really insistent that you do not have two right hands. But you could do weird things like um, stick your hand up and then clench it into a fist. And it would try and solve... You know, stick it up, but the hand is backwards from what it's expecting. And then you clench it into a fist. And it's like, oh, wait, your hand can't bend that way. <laughs> There's a lot of fun things like that that we did. Oh, but cool. It, yeah, but it is so smooth. But it's tied. Okay, here's here's the Achilles heel of this wonderful head. I would be telling everybody, get this headset right now. This is magic. But you can't. It's really, it's tied to the Oculus store. And you run Oculus titles on it. You can't run Half-Life Addict Alex on this natively, right? Hmm. It, you have to have things built for the platform. Now, for an extra, I forget how much it was. It was like 10 or 20 bucks. You get a link cable. You plug it into your computer, and it runs over the link. So it runs on your computer and then streams to the headset. Oh, I see. Because if you run just any old piece of software on it, they can't guarantee that you're going to get the Oculus experience. Right, and you can't. There is some milliseconds of lag over the link cable. And I don't know where it comes from. Is it the USB protocol or Windows or what? I don't think it's the Oculus's fault. But it is noticeably not as good. Um... The controllers, uh, you lose the ability for it to track your hands. It just becomes a passive unit, right? Um, so you can't, you have to have controllers. And the controllers, if you're running in Oculus mode, they are super silky smooth. Even if you wave them really fast in front of you, you don't see stuttering or anything, right? As soon as you're running over the link cable, the world around you will be pretty dang smooth as you turn your head and everything, but anything else gets super choppy. Like the, your controllers, when you wave your controller in front of your face, it just stutters through, through space in front of you, and it's really just gross and yucky. And uh, the field of view isn't huge. I think it has like nearly the same view, field of view as the dev kit too. And I remember on the dev kit too thinking, boy, this would be like twice as good with just 15% more field of view. So those are my two complaints with the, the Oculus Quest. Is that if you want to run games on Steam, which is where the lion's share of really good VR stuff is, you have to run it over the link cable and it won't be as silky smooth. And the second thing is you have to have a Facebook account and maybe also an Oculus account. It's really unclear, but it sounds like you need two different accounts to use this stupid thing. And I'm not even sure how you can share it. Like Isaac wanted me to 
uh, Isaac and I have been talking about me borrowing it and seeing how my computer can handle it over the link cable. See how much smoother that is. But, oh wait, it right. wants to be logged in logged into Isaac's Facebook account. Is it going to like being on my computer? Have they effectively put DRM on a piece of hardware? Yeah, right. And I just... That I admire me, the audacity, but yeah, right? that's real obnoxious. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure we haven't tried to do it, but it is one of those things, well, when we try to do it, I'm not sure how that's going to work. And that was, I think, the worst part of their setup. Was get it wasn't the the hardware. It was the stupid login stuff. Um, so I was sitting there feeling this this headset and just in love with it. Like my favorite thing is just the welcome to Oculus demo, where you've just got a table in front of you and it's got a few like a game console like an old 80s game console and a few cartridges, and if you put the cartridges in, you play, you just switch to some other game. And um, you have guns, <laughs> and you can throw them up in the air and catch them and shoot them at random crap in the room. And I was like, I spent like 20 minutes in there <laughs> just throwing things around and, and having a blast. Right, right. <laughs> it's like a VR grown-up clubhouse kind of thing. Right, right. So my thing is, I want, I want this, but a little better, a little more field of view and something to connect to the computer. Now, you would think that such a thing would be cheaper. It's not going to have hand tracking, and it's not going to need its own friggin' rendering hardware. It can just be a dumb screen. It doesn't need to, like, um, do any of it. You know, it doesn't need to render anything. Yeah. It ought to it ought to be cheaper, but no. Everything better everything else is like the next console or the next VR headset up is like five hundred dollars more. It's more than twice the price. It's ridiculous. Wow. It's I don't I'm understand at the Oculus Quest SDK here and you can't develop natively for it using Unity or anything. You have to use their own Oculus software thing. That's atrocious. Like, the first thing I wanted to do was either make some models in Blender that I could just... Okay, here's the thing. When you're on Steam, you can d go to the workshop and download all of these scenes that the community has made. Right? Just endless scenes. Oh, this person made, you know, this favorite building of theirs. Here's some guy's apartment. Here's some recreation. Oh, here's the Star Trek Enterprise Bridge, right? Like, just yeah, countless, yeah. limitless content for free. And it's all really good. Super fun. I love it. But that's only available on Steam. And the Oculus world doesn't have any of that. Probably because it's a stupid proprietary platform that requires you to get a dev license to do anything with it. You know, we, they well, already have can, basic... I don't know if you have to get a license. It, it looks like you can just download the SDK and, and get going. And you can develop for it in Unity. It's just not going to be in the, like, the Quest native format. You'll probably need the cable and all that. Right. And, of course, that's not as good of an experience. So, the Quest is wonderful. And its downside is entirely art of, or is entirely the, the need for the link cable to get to the all the fantastic content that's out there for free and the easily the easy to mod the open modding environment where everything's easy and lots of content is available that whole C it, quest feels like a console while the steam ecosystem feels like a PC that that's that's the way to think of it quest is all closed and proprietary and nobody adds anything onto it. There's just the store. Buy something from the store. I so. really like to believe that that requirement is entirely a technological one, and they just couldn't figure out a way to make it work properly, integrating with all the other content. But that doesn't seem like a reasonable assumption. 
I am really shocked at how kind of locked down and locked out the thing is because I know Carmack is the chief technology officer and he doesn't like proprietary crap. Well, he was. I don't think he is anymore. Oh, really? Did he depart the company? I thought he did. I thought he, he gave up Oculus and like went off to do AI stuff or something. Oh, no. I was wrong. It looks like he is still the CTO or consulting CTO of Oculus. You've got my hopes up. Like, I would have felt better if this was a sign that he had left. Because we've got the forced Facebook login, which is certainly entirely artificial bullshit, right? There's no reason to require that. I could see that being an option. Hey, if you want to do VR stuff with the other people on your friends list, list, just, you know, plug this into your Facebook. But no, it's required. Facebook is using this to spread their yeah. platform, he which did, makes no sense. He did leave Oculus full-time. He was at Oculus full-time, and he left about a year ago. Uh, he's still an attache, apparently, but uh, he's working mainly on artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, well, it, it's just frustrating that they were that it has all of these it it feels like a console everything locked down sealed up it's frustrating yeah yeah um i'm i'm kind of curious now how difficult it actually is to develop for a native oculus stuff like how hard would it be mm -hmm. to get it to get a, a 3d model into the headset so you didn't need a cable or anything and you could you know do something in there i i don't know Right, right. Like, how would I even get a program? Like, you acquire programs through the store within the headset or on your phone. I don't see how you can just introduce, like, your own program. But you'd have to, like, even if I had their dev kit here, I make, let's say I make a standalone program. How do I get that onto my headset? I have no idea. It just, it, it feels very locked down. And so I want to go to a PC native, which means going with HTC or I, I don't understand. I thought Valve was partnering with HTC, but now there's That's the my understanding Vi too. But there's the Valve Index and the HTC Vive, and I I think they're both like the same price. So it's like, wait, are you guys competing or friends or what? So I, I was very confused trying to sort that out today. But every, the next step up, okay, you can have the $300 headset or you can have the $1,000 headset. And I'm like, isn't there like a step between these two? <laughs> <laughs> 1000 Price check right now says 2500 Right, right. Yeah, it, it goes up from 1000 but like the next rung on the ladder is 1000 bucks, And then there's rungs oh, yeah. above that. Man. Like, what? Yikes. What? Okay, take the Oculus. Throw away the rendering crap. Have it attached natively to your PC. That ought to make it cheaper. You can even get rid of that really cool hand tracking thing since you don't totally need it. The resulting machine should be che cheaper. So why does it go up by $1,000? I don't know. And why haven't these, Man. like the H... HTC Vive has been around for years. Why hasn't it been replaced with something and the original Vive come down in price? Yeah. The the um the thing that comes to mind is that maybe the hardware itself really does cost about $1000 and that Facebook is subsidizing the Quest in order to get a bunch of people to put these things on their heads all the time, oh, all day long, yeah. and then, and then. Then they'll have basically what, what Apple was doing in the 80s. Here's all these free computers for school. And then people get out of school and they've learned Apple computers. And they're like, oh, I guess I'll go buy an Apple computer. Oh, wow, they're expensive, but it's what I know. Yeah, good, ex good user experience. Get everybody locked into it. So I am frustrated with how everything is. Like, I want to buy a headset, and I just don't see any place in the market for me. Like, the, the um, I'll bet you're right. I'll bet you're right. 
And it looks like they make these things on demand. This isn't like a console where they're like, okay, we're going to make a million of them and then sell them. It's like always, oh, you know, you'll have to wait 10 days before it ships. It's obvious they're making them in small, small batches. And that's probably really inflating the cost. <laughs> but they don't want to warehouse, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 of these things. Yeah. Especially since they're getting, they're developing the technology still, right? Right. Yeah, especially you don't want them sitting around depreciating all the time. I mean, because, but really, I mean, the HTC Vive is Although still looks there. Like the, for, yeah, there's a the original Quest is like 500 bucks. So I, I don't know how you could, that's so weird. Like the newer version costs less than the old version. Weird. I don't know. We're on the, we're, we're in the ramping up point of a new technology, so I guess we should expect everything to be really weird and confusing. <laughs> like, this, the, real, the real advances now are figuring out how to... In the middle of this sentence, I realized that last week my volume was overboosted. And I meant to check on that before the show. And in the middle of the previous sentence, I remembered I have not checked that. Oh no. So we maybe just recorded half a show. I mean, we're just going to plow forward with it. But I'm going to be so angry if this is the same crap again. You can always just turn well, it down now and, you know, hope for the best. Well, I don't want to turn it down now. Then half the show will be one volume, one volume level and the other half of the show will be at another. And that'll create all kinds of headaches for Isaac trying to balance them. Because they'll have different dynamic ranges and everything. Oh, I hate Windows so much. <laughs> yeah, the Oculus is just trying to become the Windows of VR. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. Oh, well, wait, but you didn't talk about the, the AR stuff with the camera. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, the one thing I love about the Oculus Quest that you don't get, oh this is another thing um in the old days you had to have the i forget what they're called they're not beacons or lighthouses but there's something like that you've got to put these something stations what am i what am i thinking of base stations that's right the base stations are just these things that locate the headset in 3d space so you need to have a few of them spread around your room right yeah, and they used to have cameras on them, right? They had, like, right. cameras that were tracking, and then the headset had little lights on it or whatever that would blink, and the cameras would figure out where it is. And that, obviously, is one of the contributing factors to why these older headsets are so expensive, because you've got these three camera units, and they probably have some processing in them, and that's going to jack up the price a lot. In fact, that's almost half the price right there is the base stations. Oculus hmm. Quest has inside-out tracking, meaning it's got two cameras or three cameras, I forget which, in the face. And they look at the room and just sort of solve where your headset is in the room by just tracking. Like, it, the downside is it won't work if it's dark in your room. But as long as you've got some light in there and it's bright enough that the inside-out cameras can, like, see your furniture and the walls and everything then you don't need base stations. And that lets you be more mobile, and it's just, you know, helpful. Yeah, I think it's actually four cameras, one on each corner of the front. Uh, right. And it also, it works outdoors as long as you're not in direct sunlight, because that direct sunlight washes out the cameras as well. And the other benefit of this is that if you need, if you need to see something in the real world, it's like, oops, I dropped my controller, or... You know, I just kicked a chair and I want to move it. With any other headset, you'd have to take it off. Take off the headset, do something in the real world, slip the headset back on your head. But with the Quest, you can just um, tap a button on the side of your headset and see the real world. It's really grainy and black and white, but it looks, you know, no latency. It's just the world around you. It's not like some weird 
like you'd get with like what you would expect if you have four corners on four cameras on the corners of the faceplate you would e expect your eyes to feel weirdly far apart and you'd feel tiny and it would be all weird but no it sort of makes a it, it fashions uh, a human it like builds a 3d model of the of the room and then like renders that or something well, I don't think it does that. I think it just renders, a, it uses the cameras to cover a sphere around you. I mean, you can't tell that it's doing this, but this is what I think it does. It fills a, a sphere around you, but the sphere is adjusted so that, you know, your eyes show up at the proper place and you don't feel weird. Yeah, it's doing um, some sort of transform to the video data. Right, and now it's all in black and white, and it's a little grainy, but it is so nice to not have to take the headset on and off and on and off all the time. And it's kind of funny because, you know, you you have the play zone, right? The, the square of the floor where you're allowed to move. And you map that out yourself, like, okay, this is my play area. And then as you get near to it, it'll show a Tron, you know, grid saying, hey, you know, you're about to leave your play area, mean, which lets you know, hey, you're about to headbutt, you know, the bookcase or walk into your couch or something. But as you poke your head out of the play area, it just seamlessly switches to those external cameras. So you're not blind, which was a huge problem in with the dev kit too that I owned. You stick your head out of the zone where the cameras could track you and you were just instantly blind and now it just right seamless seamlessly transitions to external view and it even fades so it really does feel like you're like poking your head into reality or into a different reality it's really cool man and i've heard that you can do like really large play areas right because you don't need to have tracking coverage you could just like walk around your house or right. something as long as you didn't mind right. bumping into things Right, if you've got a big room in your house, you can just tell it, hey, all of this is game space, and then it'll let you run all through that. So yeah, you are not limited by size. As long as your room is something that the... Like, it might get confused outdoors. If you were in an endless grassy field, it might have trouble, you know, like, which blade of grass was I tracking <laughs> is an anchor right. point. Right, like you would need some sort of anchor points for it to grab onto. In well, you could like room, sit in an airplane, for example. Like just you could sit on an airplane and like put on the headset and you'd be able to figure out where you are. Yes. Oh, wow. And, uh, and yeah, it lets you walk around and and that's really nice. So it's great but I want more field of view and I want to be able to use my PC. And apparently to do that, it has to cost two and a half times as much. And that makes no <sighs> damn sense. So I guess we're waiting for another generation. <laughs> Something with inside out tracking, which HTC hasn't done yet. And Valve hasn't done I, yet. I think I, I really need to get one of these and play around with it. It sounds... I mean, like 300 bucks is the price of a smartphone, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, but it does just leave you wishing for that 10% more. And that 10% more costs, you know, 250% more. Ah. Oh, well. Let's move on. Okay. Um, I was doing some programming at work this week, and it was pretty fun to be programming again. Yay! Still working on embedded systems, and one of the things I had trouble with was that, uh, well, one of the problems was I was just not reading the documentation, and it's so important when you're <laughs> when you're trying to do something, communicate with a device, you know, it's got like this its own special features and its own special language and like things it can do that you are actually communicating with it properly. Yeah, so what kind of device is this? Uh, this is an Arduino running a touch screen and then also a, a machine. Right, right, okay. But most of the problems occur between the touch screen and the Arduino or or between the touch screen, the Arduino, and the programmer. So one of the things I was trying to do is like, you know, just draw a rectangle on the screen. And so it's like, okay, well, 
do the x coordinate and the y coordinate and then the color that you want it to be. It's like, okay, cool, fine, x, y, you know, color. And man, I just, it was just not working. It's not working, not working. And so I trying this and trying that. And I was like, man, this is so weird. I know I've, and I go to my, look at an example so elsewhere in the code. And it's like, yep, there's those three numbers, you know, the one, two, three numbers, fine. It's just not working out. And so I finally go back to the manual and I'm like, oh, it's color, then X, then Y. Oh, wow. That is a weird order. That is not the order I would expect. Yeah, but, you know, and and it's not consistent across them. Like, if you're drawing text, you'll, you'll have, like, the X and then the Y and then the text that you want it to display. And so it, it there are a variety of different interfaces. Um, I see. So it's a terrible garbage API. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not a... I've, I've not been super impressed by it. Uh, but at least their documentation is correct. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I mean, that beats undocumented. Like, uh, a confusing API with good documentation is probably much better than an elegant API with no documentation. Because in the latter case, even though you won't need the documentation as much, when you do need it, you really need it, and you won't have it. <laughs> Yeah. So the other problem I ran into was uh, it's communicating over a, a, it's not a USB connector, but I think the actual communication method is USB. It's, you know, four lines to our power to our serial. And, uh, and it's got bandwidth limitations, but I wasn't really aware of like exactly what those were. And so one of the things I'm doing is I'm drawing a progress bar and, you know, I tell it to do a thing and it's got a little progress bar that draws across the screen and the progress bar is a fixed length. And then, so then the length of the thing that you're doing determines how many times a second you have to update the progress bar, you know, show each pixel updating. And so I did right. the calculations and do the math and, and uh, normally it runs at like 30 seconds or so, a 30 second thing. And, you know, the bar is only maybe 200 pixels wide. And so, these are updating it, you know, somewhere around one or two times a second. Um, but it turns out that if you turn the settings all the way down and have it perform a one or two second operation, now it's trying to update like in just a few milliseconds. And there's just not enough bandwidth on that serial bus to get all that data through. Wow. So what, is, what happens? Does it get behind? Like, will it eventually get there, or does it start skipping? I I think it starts. I think it starts dropping commands. Like you you issue a command, and you issue another command, and it'll just start dropping them out of the out of the um, the queue. There's probably some sort of like com queue or whatever. And when it gets too long, it just starts dropping stuff out of the queue and putting the new stuff in. Because I never noticed it getting behind or anything. Like it always kept up. But what does drop out is that there's it's two way the the screen communicates touch sensor information back to the Arduino and the Arduino communicates to the touch screen screen updates um, but they both have to communicate over that same serial bus and I think what happens is the Arduino has has privilege so the Arduino's pumping this data through and if you touch the abort button on the screen it'll just keep on trucking because the screen's like, I have something to tell you. And the Arduino's like, no time. Keep going. Keep drawing that progress bar. <laughs> so you have to you have to be very careful to stay under this limit, which you don't know. Yeah, it, well, and it's probably documented somewhere, but I'm not a good programmer. I don't care about the, you know, the data rate or whatever. Like, so I just put a delay on the on the progress bar update thing. So like if it's updating more than X times a millisecond or whatever, just like don't update every once in a while, and, and that works. So I want to tell you a story about my Uncle Bruce. Tell me a story. Actually, this is a very short story because I didn't hear the end of it. But anyway, Bruce is, my, for, those of you, for those of the audience that um, have followed my adventures and read my personal story, Bruce is the uncle that worked on the Apollo program and now has some of his work, you know, some piece of thing that he built for the Apollo is now hanging in the Smithsonian. Um, and he's also the guy that 
uh, sold me my first real IBM compatible computer. He he sold me his ancient IBM, uh, and gave me all the books for learning C. And that's what I did for the summer after I graduated. So this is a, I like cool him already, uncle, right? Um, this is my cool uncle Bruce. He's gone now, sadly. Uh, but right after he gave me this computer, or he didn't give it to me, he sold it to me. Um, I remember him visiting, I think it was either for Christmas or Thanksgiving. He lived in Boston, and he came to visit. And he was telling me about a problem he was trying to solve for a client. It was this simple thing where two computers, two ancient computers, two ancient, dusty, probably built by the Mayan computers were trying to do something together. And one of them just needed to like send data to the other, and he was handling the receiving computer. And so he just needs to get data that's being sent at a certain rate. You know, just like, I don't know, it's once it's like over a, a COM port or something. Uh, it sounded that way. It, I mean, it's literally been 30 years since I heard this, since I had this conversation <laughs> right. with them. So it's all a little, it's, I'm sitting on the steps right outside my bedroom. I could picture the place, but not the, not the, I can't remember the words. Um, and he was telling me the one computer was like some big mainframey kind of thing. And it could just keep up, you know, and just send these packets of information. But then the, the dummy client or the client computer was just some piece of absolute ancient garbage. And, you know, sometimes the data would stop coming in. Like there wasn't a, okay, I'm done now. There could be a, there could be a case where, you know, the stream of data would just end and you need to know, like, Okay, have we stalled? The computer's sitting there listening. Okay, the next data. Is there any more data? Any more data? Any more data? Just waiting. Anything to come over this COM port. Is there any more? Is there any more? You know, the thing to do in this case, you, you don't want it to get stuck in a loop if there's no more data. So you just need to hmm. look at the clock. Just real quick, glance at the clock and see, okay, have I been sitting here for, you know, 12 microseconds or have I been sitting here for um, you know five minutes how long has it been since the last time I looked at the clock however checking its own clock was slower than the rate of incoming information so if the program stopped to look at the clock it could miss an incoming uh, bit of data and there was no oh, way to no. solve this it was just too slow. Like, imagine you're reading text on the screen and you want to know how long you've been reading. And it's just scrolling constantly. The time it takes you to turn your head to look at the clock and look back, you, an entire page will have gone by and you won't know what you missed. That was the problem he was, he was dealing with. And I never found out how he dealt with it. Oh, man. I don't suppose there's a way to change the protocol. Yeah, I don't know the parameters. I mean, if his company was doing both sides, then absolutely. You just, like, slow it down. But um, Or have some sort of semaphore system where it's like, you ready to receive data? Hey, you ready to receive data? Right. right. Although, I think, given the setup, it would be something like, hey, you ready to receive data? Yes. <laughs> okay, here comes the data. <laughs> Okay. Did you get the data? I got it. <laughs> Just be like, why is this why is this taking 20 minutes? Yeah, turn the baud rate all the way down. <laughs> Who needs more than 300 baud anyway? There's actually a baud rate setting on the program that programs the touch screen. Which is kind of funny. Wow, baud rate as like a unit of measure of throughput. I mean, that was really common back in the day, but I haven't heard of anything limited by baud in decades. 
embedded Everything systems, needs... they're still they're yep. still hardware limited. Right. I mean, I'm used to, you know, oh, how many megabytes per second can we push through this baby? <laughs> Not bod. <laughs> yeah. This leaky faucet that drips once per minute. And you're trying to fill up a bucket. All right. Um, I guess let's talk about Amnesia Rebirth. I finally played. This is one of the games I've been waiting for all year, and I'm finally playing it. Yes! And it's pretty good. It's not the instant classic that Amnesia the Dark Descent was. But it's also not the snore fest that A Machine for Pigs was. Um, all right. The, my one, I mean, it's it's set in a more modernish wor modern world that feels like uh, early part of the 20th century. I, I haven't really nailed down. I mean, people are flying around in planes, but it feels like just before World War II kind of technology. Like Indiana Jones level of technology is the vibe I get from it. Okay. Uh, but that doesn't matter because... Spoiler, in the first, you know, 10 seconds of the game, the plane crashes and leaves you in the desert. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird. A desert. Normally, horror is much more interested in very cold and dark, not very hot and bright. Yeah, and, and like damp, festering, moldy things as opposed to like dry sand. Right, right. And that was kind of weird, but it did feel tense. I mean, like, real deserts are dangerous. <laughs> Even though we don't associate them with horror, they'll kill you. They'll kill you just as fast as... Actually, not quite as fast as, say, you know, Antarctica will kill you. But they will they will get you. It might take a little longer. You might have to suffer a little longer before you're finally mercifully dead. Yeah. Um... It, and but then eventually you make it underground, um, and that's where the spook times start. Oh, I, oh, thank goodness! I thought there was going to be like some sort of I don't like sand reference. <laughs> and the true horror would begin. <laughs> right, that would just be too scary. Maybe that's the the final boss is just is just ten minutes of Anakin complaining about sand. Um, so I like the game. My one complaint is I don't, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this without spoiling it. I've just gotten to the first like building in the game. Like I was just going through caves and caves and caves. And I was like, is this entire game caves? No, I finally made it to like, what is this? A castle, a fortress, a monastery? I don't know what it is, but it's a thing. Now the game has given me a reason to go on. It, I'm I'm trying to save someone, and I'm trying to save myself too. So I've got a reason to push forward. This isn't just this isn't just like Doom, where we'll go to the next level. But why? So you can go to the next level. This is you know I I have personal motivation, but I don't have any motivation to go to this building. You go in the front door. It's a spook fest. And you even go to a kitchen and your your character says, oh, it's a kitchen, but I'm not really hungry or thirsty. And for one thing, that raised my eyebrow. I'm like, am I playing a dead person or a spirit or something? Because <laughs> that was a long <laughs> trek through those caves. And uh, you ought to be pretty parched by now. So yeah, I wonder I, if... I, as a human player, have gotten up and had a sandwich at some point. <laughs> and you, the character, have been doing all the running and jumping. I don't know where you're getting your energy from. Exactly. But, like, why am I in this incredibly dangerous building if I don't need anything here? There's nothing to... There's nothing to motivate me. Um, like, what am I going to get out of this place? Or how does this advance my goals? And... And that's my... The game has been a little weak in that area. It just... You have to assume your goal... You have to trust that if you just keep shoving through horrible um, nightmare worlds that somehow you'll come out the other side. Like, you know, why am I not trying to just build a big bonfire out in front of this building and signal for help or something? Like, what's the plan? Right. Well, You've got some sort of long-term goal that 
you're like, okay, this is the idea that I'm moving toward, but like, I guess the levels are pretty linear. Um, they were until I reached this building, and then I felt like, oh wow, I've got a lot of doors I can go through, and I'm not sure, like, what's my goal? Why would I pick one of these over the mm -hmm. other? Um, the the other thing to note is, uh, Dark Descent had the lantern mechanic. You needed to keep the place lit to keep from going insane. This game has matches and a lantern, but the lantern you get is super, like, you find a can of oil and it'll give you 30 seconds of burn time. So the lantern is definitely something to be, like, turned on for two seconds and then turned off again. Like a flashlight. <laughs> right. And, and the, like, a candle, a little tiny tea light will last for an hour or more. Right, right. And there are candles, and you can't take them. Like, you start, when you run into these incredibly artificial in-game limitations, you start overthinking it, because it's like, I've got, okay, I've got three matches left. Well, I can use this one match to light all these candles. Okay, now the room is bright. Now I have to go into the dark tunnel where there are no lights, and my character will gradually freak out. Um, so why can't I, so I go up, walk up to a candle. Oh, I see there's some sort of interact icon, hit it. And my character reaches out and snuffs out the light. And if I want to turn it back Wait, on, why? I got you know, like, why would I do that? I saw, I saw a, like, every time I see a new light source, I think, oh, this I can take with me, press the button again and it snuffs it out. And I'm like, I, I fall for that three times. And I'm just like, why, why are you allowing my character to snuff out light when there is never any reason to ever, ever, ever do that. The player is never doing that on purpose. Meanwhile, I'm here like, look, this is a big candle. This solves all my problems. Let me grab big candle and walk down the hallway with it in front of me. That also solves all my problems. <laughs> and I hate it because it's, it breaks your immersion. It's like the game is so fussy with light. Like it correctly... Um, models the behavior of a lit match. You know, you walk forward and the match, you know, gets a little dimmer from the movement of air. And if you walk forward really fast, it'll burn out quickly. So if you want to preserve a match, you sort of walk very slowly. Like, you went to all this trouble to simulate a match, but I can't pick up a friggin' candle. Yeah. Um... And the matches were so stingy at the beginning of the game, I ran out. I mean, I was just sort of fiddling around with the match mechanic and like, oh, oh, you can light multiple things with the match. All right, well, light another one and write, oh, here's some other things I didn't. Well, I guess I'm supposed to be lighting to use my last match. And then I have no matches and I'm in the dark and there are all these candles. And I'm like, I'm obviously supposed to light these, but like, I don't have any matches left. Were there some I was supposed to find and I didn't? Am I like in some broken game state? <laughs> The developers didn't account for and then I was really low on matches and uh, in these dark tunnels where you obviously even if you I mean Paul think about it like how many matches could you carry at one time uh, like conveniently it, yeah. with the pants I have right now or just like in my hand yeah. like a fistful of matches is like a hundred that's right, 10 matches. No human being could possibly carry more than that. No, no, of course not. I, what was I thinking? <laughs> right. Like 10, like 10 matches in one fist, and then you're like, well, here's an 11th match. Obviously, I should leave it here, because how could I possibly lift it? So, yeah, you got to get the bandolier. <laughs> so there's that stupid mechanic. But, you know, I get in this long hallway where there's, it's obvious, even if I was, had 10 matches, if I had, if I was just a Rockefeller here, just the height of luxury and burned 10 matches, I couldn't get down this hallway without getting freaked out because I'd be walking in the dark for so long. So I'm like, oh, all right. Um, and I seriously thought there must have been a lantern somewhere that I missed. And like an hour later, I found a lantern. You know, you need to 
slip on and off like a flashlight. The whole light mechanic is just super nonsense. And it kind of annoys me because I thought Dark Descent was about right. And um, this game is much more complicated for no reason. And it's far more distracting and weird. Hmm. And just wait till you get to the match room where there's like matches covering every surface and if you try to light anything the whole room goes up <laughs> actually that would be the most horrible thing they could do is just have a pile of 20 matches and the player would never want to leave that pile because it would mean leaving 10 matches behind <laughs> i'm not willing to leave behind those riches you just become like Gollum, hoarding your precious matches right i'm just that's it that's my life now i'm gonna stay here and just guard the hoard like a dragon uh, but I'm having a good time with the game. It's it's not as scary, but it's really pretty, and I don't know, it's fun. Which leads us to our first mailbag. You want to take it? Dear Diecast, the new Amnesia game has me thinking about this video. Link to a YouTube video. TLDW, the trick of the original Amnesia is that nothing really bad actually happens when you run low on sanity. The camera controls might get wacky, and you won't actually screw up a playthrough by mismanaging your lamp oil. The devs found that the buff was more effective than the actual consequences of failure. Or the bluff, excuse me, was more effective. Do you guys think that any other games would benefit from this sort of design? Are there any other sort of mechanics that could have benefited from being fake, for lack of a better word? Thanks, Caden. Thank you, Caden. So, that's an interesting question. Could we transplant this mechanic to another game? And nothing immediately jumps out at me, but I like it at how well it worked. When I played Descent, Dark Descent, I absolutely believed that I was in danger at the worst my sanity got. And the only reason I thought that is because that's how all video games work. You've got to, you've got to manage your numbers. Yeah, Don't it really was kind numbers. of cashing in on a lot of conventions, right? Right. But it... You know, just leave it vague and the player doesn't know what could happen. Or, you know, you could make the you could make the cons I mean, it wasn't that it had no consequences. It was really creepy the way the the view would distort and you'd start hearing things and you'd start seeing bugs on the end of your edge of your vision, which I get that when I have a bad fever. That literally happens to me. I'll see bugs all out of the corner of my eye constantly. So that oh, really wow. gets me. Yeah. Just any black dot in the room will seem to be moving if I have a really high fever. So that really got me. Um, that effect. And that, you know, that's just a visual effect. That wasn't, oh, game over, you died. And that game was one of the scariest games I've ever played. And it scared me without ever having to, like, kick me out to a game over screen. So I thought it was brilliant, but like that only works in other horror movie games and other horror movie game or horror games generally aren't about atmosphere. They're about systems and resource management, like the most recent um, Resident Evil game is all about managing how much you've got of each thing and managing your health and drinking health potions and fighting monsters. Like, that's the way everybody making horror games wants to go. And that's it's Dark completely... Souls, basically. Right. And that's the opposite direction that... that um, Dark Des Or the Amnesia games want to go. They want to make you... Put you in a situation where you are up against things you can't fight. You cannot punch this thing to death. You don't have any guns. The only thing you could do is run and hide. And I think that's one of the reasons this is such a powerful game, you know, emotionally. Mm -hmm. I think the the most horror-y kind of game that I am comfortable playing is Don't Starve, uh, which also has that kind of thing where there's a lots of things in the environment that you can't just beat up, like right. you're up against hunger. Like you can't just kill hunger. You can't just get a big enough axe to kill your sanity problems. Right. And in that game, sanity really is a system where you'll die if your sanity gets too low. So I, I don't know. It, it does seem like you have to. Okay. So, so if, 
if amnesia is about atmosphere, then the display stuff is like part of the game, right? Like that is kind of a lose condition. It's a lose state. It's not like a final lose state, but it's like a you are not doing well state. Yeah. Yeah. It's like in Missile Command when several of your cities are destroyed, but not all of them. You know you're doing poorly. Right. Right. And if Missile Command just kept going, if all your cities were destroyed, right? Right. Or if it just never shot at your last city. You know, it would just keep bombing all the others, but it made you feel... You know, missiles would constantly sail right, but just miss that last city. So that you always think you're about to die. That would be a lot like what this game is doing. Hmm. Because, you know, you can do that in Amnesia. If, you know, you're like, ha ha, I'm not going to take the game seriously. And you just run around like an idiot and bunny hop on everything. Um, you'll, very, you'll very quickly realize the game has no teeth. It's all threats and no delivery. Which, that's fine. You weren't trying to be... You, didn't want, you evidently didn't want to be scared. <laughs> right. <laughs> if if you wanted to be scared, you would have acted. You would have participated in this in this fiction. It requires your participation, and it requires you to take it seriously. And if you're not gonna, then why are you playing a horror game? It's very well done. It's not as good in um, Rebirth. It's not as it's not as strong, and I. I'm not sure why. I think I'll need to take it. I haven't seen, like, an actual monster coming from... Well, there was, like, a flash of light and um, something backlit was in the distance. And, I, and it was just, like, a few frames. Like, what, what was that? Did I see something? What? Hmm. Well, now I really don't want to go through this door. Like, that kind of thing. But, I, you know, I haven't had any moments where, like, a monster is coming at you and you have to go do the hide thing. I'm trying to remember the name of the developer that did all those uh, games where you've got like situations and, and dialogue and, and your you know, like zombie game or whatever. Um, oh, is it Telltale? Uh, Telltale uh, did The Walking Dead. I don't know if you'd classify that as, as scary. Where, where they're like, uh, so-and-so will remember this, right? Like, Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, that was... Uh, was that, that Telltale? Was Telltale. That's telltale. Yeah, yeah. So I I feel like that is kind of the same as this, right? Where like it would say, oh, so and so will remember this, but sometimes they didn't. Like a lot of right. times it was bluffing about the story, right? And so in, in that game, it wasn't a horror game; it was kind of a, a relationship game. But a lot of times it was bluffing about what kind of things were actually happening, what kind of relationship impacts you were actually having. But it worked right. because. You believed it, and you're like, okay, well, I'm making these choices, and this character's reacting as if that this matters to them, and so you believed it, even if it really didn't. Yeah, and that did that worked really well. Although I think they pushed it too far by the end of the series, you could tell it was bluffing. If they'd had a little more delivery, if they delivered on a few more of them, or a few more, or a few moments where it looked like they were going to deliver on it, um, it would have been much stronger. Like, they they needed to work a little harder to maintain that fiction. I feel like, in, uh, as opposed to Caden's suggestion of making more mechanics fake, that it would be more effective to insert a bunch of fake mechanics, but then occasionally follow up on them. Uh, right. Like with the Telltale games. Where, like, if, for example, if Amnesia Dark Descent would occasionally kill you, then it would then it would be much more convincing because there would be some teeth behind that threat, right? And it kind of did. I mean, if your sanity hit rock bottom, you'd pass out. And then you'd wake up with your sanity back up to like 15% or whatever. That felt like... I mean, that was equivalent to dying and respawning, you know? And you felt, hmm. like, you're, you felt like a failure and you're not sure what you lost. Is this if they hinted that you know if you want the good ending you better keep your sanity high that would have really motivated people to to I mean you'd need to phrase it more carefully but if you hinted or even literally did um, 
have how have their overall sanity or how many times their sanity hit rock bottom affect which ending they get that was a that'd be another way to handle it hmm or like if you're jumping on the monster's head it just like erases your save game yeah but nobody would ever do that <laughs> absolutely nobody would ever do that much less film themselves doing it <laughs> right that's just crazy well paul i think we've done a show Man, it went by so fast. Right? Um, anyway, thanks to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, the email is diecast at shamusyoung.com. A uh, little heads up, I've been in talks with Ross. Um, I'll link. Um, if you don't know who he is, I'm, I'm going to link to his blog. We worked on Good Robot together. He worked on Watch Dogs Legion. We're going to have him on the show sometime after Legion comes out. So I don't know if it'll be next week or the week after that. I'm not sure. I've, I'm kind of disorganized. Spoiler. <laughs> anyway, so if you have any questions for him, you can send those into the diecast at well. As well, I'm going to be talking about... I'm going to spend most of an episode, or maybe even all of an episode, on Watch Dogs Legion one of these weeks. So that's what's coming up. Um, anyway, thanks again to everybody who sent in questions. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye. Goodbye.